Velociraptors. Some of the most iconic movie monsters of all time. But how much of them is monster and how much of them is real? And is their name really Latin? Or is the actual name now, you might have some idea of what I'm talking about, but I bet you don't know the whole story. I'm Luke, and this is Polymathy. While this is what the 1993 Jurassic Park version of Velociraptor looks like, the real animal actually looked more like this. Or indeed, more like this. About the size and possibly plumage of a turkey. So why does the Jurassic Park animal look more like a six foot turkey? Were the movie makers deliberately transgressing against science? Gee, the lack of humility before nature that's being displayed here. Um... Staggers. Well, the feathers part comes a little bit later in the story, so stick around for that part of the video. A huge problem with the Jurassic Park dig site is that it's in the Badlands of Montana in North America. But the Velociraptor lived in Eastern Asia, hence one of the species' names, Velociraptor mongoliensis, the swift Caesar of Mongolia. Yet there is a North American dinosaur that rather resembles Velociraptor. Deinonychus. In the 1960s, paleontologist John Ostrom studied the Deinonychus in detail, and it's his work that led to a profound change in paleontology, the renaissance of dinosaur paleontology. For a long time, dinosaurs have been conceived of as slow, lumbering, cold-blooded animals, but this swift, agile predator challenged that old view. And Michael Crichton's book, in his screenplay for the Jurassic Park film, put front and center Ostrom's idea that dinosaurs were very active, raptors being one of the most impressive examples of this agility. And thanks to the film, it's this view, the active, warm-blooded dinosaur, that has taken hold in the public conscious. Now, as terrifying as the animals were in the Jurassic Park book, Steven Spielberg wanted something a bit different. And that's because the Deinonychus, called the Velociraptor in the book, is only about three feet tall. And he wanted them to be about five to six feet tall, about as tall as a man, much scarier. So Steven Spielberg enlarged the creature we call Deinonychus from about one meter tall to about two meters tall, that is from about three feet to six feet. It's almost as if Spielberg genetically engineered the raptor to suit his desires with the power of cinematography. The most awesome force the planet's ever seen, but you wield it like a, a kid that's found his dad's gun. That might be a bit uncharitable, Malcolm. Spielberg did this for a very compelling reason. Having raptors be the height of a man makes the creature incredibly intimidating, intelligent, and working together like humans, they made an even more exciting and terrifying antagonist for the film, even than the great Tyrannosaurus Rex. <laughs> So why was this souped up Hollywood version of Deinonychus called Velociraptor? Just because it's a cooler sounding name? Kind of, but that's actually not Spielberg's fault. Paleo artist Gregory S. Paul published a book in 1988 called Predatory Dinosaurs of the World. And in his book, he tried to revise some of the dinosaur taxonomy. It was evident by this time that Deinonychus and Velociraptor, while predators from different continents, had a common ancestor. To him, it made sense to classify Deinonychus under the name of the creature that was discovered formerly, the Velociraptor. That is, he considered Velociraptor the overarching name, and Deinonychus to be under that umbrella. Michael Crichton had read Paul's book and liked the name Velociraptor over Deinonychus. So the behavioral traits of the animal we see on screen, attributed by Ostrom to Deinonychus, were now transferred to Velociraptor for the book and the movie of Jurassic Park. But that naming convention of making Deinonychus under an umbrella Velociraptor, that didn't stick. By the 90s, the naming conventions had quite stabilized. So now, Velociraptors and Deinonychus, while clearly related animals, aren't considered to be all under the Velociraptor name. Instead, they're all part of the subfamily of the Dromaeosaurids. Vromos, meaning running, and Savra, a lizard. So this means the Hollywood raptors ultimately 
are misnamed. Although at the time, Crichton wasn't exactly wrong, he was just using a naming convention which now is no longer accepted. So from John Ostrom to Gregory Paul to Michael Crichton to Steven Spielberg, the image of the prehistoric animal Velociraptor has been indelibly printed on the collective human psyche as this instead of this. Is Spielberg really to blame? Uh, it didn't require any discipline to attain it. Well, you read what others had done and you, and you took the next step. You didn't earn the knowledge for yourselves, so you don't take any responsibility. Actually, Spielberg gets credit for an even more amazing discovery. Well, sorta. In 1991, the production of Jurassic Park was in full swing, and the six-foot-tall Raptor animatronics had been built and were already being used. Then that year, an amazing and totally coincidental discovery came to light in the world of paleontology. A large dromaeosaurid, very much like Deinonychus but twice as tall, named the Utah Raptor. When Spielberg heard this, he thought, he was a genie. A genius. He had willed the Velociraptor of his film, the double-sized Deinonychus, into existence. That's impressive, Stephen. You stood on the shoulders of geniuses uh, to accomplish something as fast as you could, and before you even knew what you had, patented it, and packaged it, and slapped it on a plastic lunchbox, and now <laughs> you're selling it. You're gonna sell it. Thus, the dinosaur we see on screen, a creature that's called Velociraptor in the film, based on Deinonychus, but doubled in size, is actually... A Utah Raptor, essentially. Clever girl. It is a plausible representation of an animal from that time period. Well, at least in how big it is. More like a six foot turkey. The turkey part is actually on the right track because some years back, numerous theropod fossils were discovered with feathers. Theropods are the clade of bipedal dinosaurs that included dromaeosaurids, that is the raptors, as well as the tyrannosaurids. Huh, six foot turkey? Try a 13 foot turkey. No one of these guys learn how to fly. Birds also evolved from theropods. The word theropod comes from the Greek thera, meaning a wild beast, and pus, meaning a foot. Wild beast foot. I'd say it looks like one. And this ostrich definitely has one. Have you ever met one? They're basically dinosaurs. This is a reason why some consider that the dinosaurs did not all go extinct, as modern birds are directly descended from the theropod clade. So, is the Velociraptor name really Latin? Sic et non. Velox means fast, and raptor means one who steals. This is why birds of prey are called raptors. And even the word raptor means bird of prey. Thank you, Dr. Grant. However, Latin doesn't really join words together like this. It would tend to prefer two separate words, but scientific taxonomy does require a joined name for these groups. We don't usually get a double word in a single part of the echelon. Thus, the scientific names, which are sometimes called Latin names, I'd say maybe erroneously, because most of the time these scientific names, although they have Latin roots, they have Greek roots, they so frequently disobey the normal rules of Latin grammar and vocabulary and word formation, as well as Greek, that calling them Latin or Greek is maybe giving them too much credit. So they're just scientific names inspired by Latin and Greek terminology. And that means that pronunciation is obviously going to be all over the place. In English, Velociraptor is a perfectly fine way to say the name. It follows the phonetic rules of English just fine. If we wanted to use an ecclesiastical pronunciation, Velociraptor, and classical, Velociraptor. But I don't think saying those names in normal scientific discourse is going to get any of us too far. Try it though, let me know how it goes. And we just shouldn't get too upset about some kind of standardized or correct pronunciation of the Latin and Greek terms that are used in science, especially in these scientific taxonomies, because a lot of the times these words are bizarre chimeras. And we even get words like Utah Raptor. It's pretty obvious that for the past hundred years or more, most scientists don't learn Latin or ancient Greek to any appreciable degree, and that's fine. It just means that a lot of the names they come up with aren't really what I would consider to be really Latin or really Greek. They're inspired instead by them, kind of like Harry Potter. And while as an avid fan of the classical languages, I find this embarrassing, we really just have to roll with it. And that's why pronunciation of the names is actually the least of our concerns. Now, while a Latinate name like Velociraptor, this formation, eh, it's okay, but the 
formation of words together doesn't happen very often. This does happen all the time with Greek terms. So let's look at the hyper Greek name of Deinonychus. The roots here are vinos, which means terrible, and onyx, which means claw. This refers to the classic dromaeosaurid sickle claw. And he slashes at you with this. That we associate with the Jurassic Park raptors. <laughs> Now, something interesting here is that the vinos, word meaning terrible, is the same vinos in the word of dinosaur, vinosauros, terrible lizard, the dinosaur. So why is this name, Deinonychus, spelled E-I, and this one, dinosaur, spelled with an I? Well, it's the same reason that we spell Poseidon E-I instead of with simply the letter I. I talked about this in great detail in my video about Epsilon Iota. And yes, Greeks, that's how those letters are pronounced in English. Just as Deinonychus and Velociraptor are the English pronunciations of those names, we're not going to say Epsilon or Iota in English. By the classical period, Epsilon Iota was the same sound as classical Latin long E. And that's how it's transcribed normally. When we take Greek words into English, we transcribe them normally according to Latin rules. And the long E vowel of older forms of English went from E to E to I, 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 I. And now we pronounce it I in modern English. Simon Roper has a number of very cool videos about that subject, which you should check out. So Greek words that get borrowed into English, even if it's directly and not through some ancient way like philosophy, which of course was a word in Latin before it came into the Romance languages, into Middle French, and eventually into modern English. When we take new Greek words, we usually Latinize them, just like the ancient Romans did. That's why it's Deinonychus with a U-S and not Deinonychos with an OS. So if we wanted to be consistent here with a fully Latinized spelling, it should be Deinonychus like this, but it doesn't really matter. So now you know the story, how this little guy got conflated with this slightly bigger guy and then got artificially enlarged to this guy, which was then discovered to be a real thing anyway. And a little bit about the Latin scientific names of these animals. When we go back and watch Jurassic Park, should we then just throw out the Velociraptor name altogether and consider it completely wrong? I know this guy would like to throw him right out, but just like many fun aspects of etymology, history, and science, the weird way that these things have come to light is in itself an interesting story and helps to connect us with the etymologies, with the language, with the paleontology and the science. And that's all valuable to know. Overall, Jurassic Park served its purpose, introducing the idea of agile, warm-blooded dinosaurs so deeply into the public conscious that these old, lumbering, cold-blooded depictions aren't really remembered anymore. And that's probably for the best. Thanks so much for watching and subscribing. Walete.